starts right now. On the heels of President Joe Biden's announcement that people who work for employers with more than 100 employees and those who work for the federal government must now get the COVID-19 vaccine, several specific questions have surfaced in response. That's right. Now, we're still waiting for President to actually sign an executive order, but before businesses start to change their policies, we decided to take those questions to a local lawyer. She says to sit still because this mandate is still evolving. Lawyer with Kubeta Law Group, Kelly Kubeta, says as this mandate is still developing, her advice. For now, um, employees and employers just just wait until we know more. The announcement has left people with questions like, is it legal? There are certain industries that it has been acceptable, like, for example, in the healthcare industry. Kubeta says having a vaccine requirement should also be in connection to job related duties. Generally, that's kind of the direction that OSHA has been leaning in is that, yes, I mean, employers have the right to try and create as safe as possible of a a workplace for their employees. But let me be clear, they've been very vague. <laughs> what if a person works remotely? That's a bit of a stretch to say, OK, this is really necessary um, for for the safety of the others um, at that company, because if they're not all sitting together in the same room, they're not interacting. Another question. Can I get fired if I choose not to get the vaccine? Kubeta says if the new policy is in writing, it may be difficult to challenge. If they are terminated, then there would be an argument for the company to say that you are being terminated for cause, which means because you violated a company policy, therefore we're terminating you. She added that as the Occupational Safety and Health Administration works out all of the kinks, employers will find that this is not a one size fits all type of situation. You can't just have an across the board, everybody get vaccinated. There's got to be this process or option for these valid exceptions to be evaluated. And there's got to be a means for which, OK, what are we going to do with people that have a valid reasons for, for not getting vaccinated? Now, we also spoke with Kubeta in relation to the unemployment benefits. Should a person be fired or laid off because of a decision not to get the vaccine? She says it's up to the Texas Workforce Commission to decide on a case by case basis. New tonight, a road rage shooting leaves San Antonio police looking for a suspect and one man in the hospital. Now, the incident happened on the north side while two vehicles involved were driving on the access road of I-10. Police say a vehicle drove up to a truck and started firing multiple shots. Part of the truck was damaged and the driver was hit once in the back. Police found that man on West Wildwood, not far from Blanco Road in Fresno. He was taken to University Hospital in critical condition. And continuing coverage now of a shooting we first told you about is breaking news last night. The Bear County Medical Examiner's Office is still working to identify the man shot and killed by BCSO deputies on the east side. Shooting happening during a traffic stop around 1030 last night near I-35 and Hormel Drive, not far from Splashtown. A chase happened between two deputies and a suspect. Sheriff Javier Salazar believes the suspect fired shots at those deputies. The chase stopped near a warehouse where a deputy shot and killed the man. Three passengers were detained at the scene. The deputy involved is on administrative leave, pending the outcome of the investigation. Over the course of the last four days now, we've had uh, three times that deputies have been shot at. Of course, we know over at the SAPD, they had two officer involved shootings last night as well. Uh, so while I can't comment on, the, on theirs uh, too much, uh, what I do know is out of out of and Sheriff Salazar worried there that there are more legal guns on the street new to do gun, new due to new gun laws. And those guns are being stolen more and ending up in the wrong hands. The night team's John Paul Barajas has the sheriff's message to gun owners. Bear County Sheriff's deputies have been shot at three times in four days. Thursday morning on the far west side, they encountered men who were going street by street, breaking into cars. As they went to stop them, the suspects took off running and shooting at the two responding deputies before being caught. We believe that that, that suspect actually emptied his gun on the deputy. And, you know, we're just lucky that we're not talking about, uh, you know, a dead or, or seriously injured deputy. Then Saturday on the east side, a traffic stop for a taillight violation turned into a gunfight. The suspect is said to have been running behind a warehouse and fired at least one shot as he tried to get away. The deputy, also a SWAT team operator, uh, did a great job of using his vehicle for concealment, uh, retrieved his patrol rifle and engaged that suspect. He fired at least two shots 
and that suspect was shot at least once in the upper body and died there on the scene. On Saturday into Sunday morning, deputies got a call for gunshots. When they got to the scene, they tried pulling over a white charger. Other cars interfered, and deputies report they started to get shot at. Luckily, no one was hurt, but the charger did get away. In both situations where the suspects were stopped, the guns had been stolen. It's problematic. I mean, I, I do I do see a problem with it. It is. I'm 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 terrified of it. I believe that we're going to be seeing more. I think that we're we're going to see uh, more by the end of the year. And Sheriff Salazar said he knew they'd see more legal guns on the streets with the lax gun laws in effect, and he's okay with that. But he wants gun owners to better secure their weapons so thieves ending up with them doesn't get out of control. John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. John Paul, thank you. Two SAPD officers on administrative duty after they shot a man during an arrest attempt on the south side early this morning. The shooting happened just after midnight on Pima Street, not far from Somerset Road and I-35. San Antonio police say the officers approached the man's vehicle. It was during that encounter. Police say the man allegedly tried to pull a handgun from his waistband. That's when the officers fired at the man. He was pronounced dead at the scene. He has yet to be identified by the Bear County Medical Examiner's Office. A man could be facing charges for a shooting just west of downtown today. He's in custody and another man is in the hospital. The shooting happened around 3 p.m. near Frio and Houston streets. That's when police arrived on the scene. They found a man with a gunshot to his stomach. He was taken to Bamsey in critical condition. As for the other man who police believe is the suspect, he was found by police running away from the scene. He was eventually taken into custody outside SAPD headquarters. San Antonio police are looking for three suspects in connection to a shootout with SAPD officers at a nightclub on the northwest side. The shooting happened at the Burn House nightclub off North Loop 1604 West around 2.15 a.m. Police say a security guard asked three people to leave when the altercation started. The group made it outside where another altercation happened. San Antonio police showed up and say the group got into a vehicle, moved to the front of the club, and pulled out guns. At least one shot was fired. An innocent body bystander was hit while sitting in her car. If you've been in the area of Evergreen and Main Street, you may have noticed the rainbow crosswalks have been paved over. Don't worry, they'll be back in just a few weeks. The crosswalks were painted to recognize San Antonio's LGBTQ plus community. District 1 Councilman Mario Bravo says work is being done on underground utilities there to bring the intersection into compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act. He says the new asphalt has to cure or harden for at least 15 days, weather permitting, and then new rainbow crosswalks will be installed at Maine and Evergreen. In response to the severe weather threats along the Gulf Coast, due to Tropical Storm Nicholas, Governor Greg Abbott is ordering the Texas State Operations Center to increase its readiness to level two. Preparations along the coast are already underway. This is video of the seawall being raised in Galveston. Several services have been activated like swift water rescue boat squads, ground transportation platoons with high profile vehicles and the Texas Emergency Medical Task Force. Nicholas is expected to bring in significant Significant rainfall flooding to much of Texas coast, but what can we expect in the San Antonio area? Let's check in with our Katie Blake with what we need to know. Thank you, Jaffney. Yes, we're going to hear a lot about Tropical Storm Nicholas in the coming days because it is going to produce significant flooding along the Texas coast, especially off closer to the Houston and Galveston areas. Impacts here for us in San Antonio are not going to be nearly that extreme, but this system is expected to bring us some rain mainly on Monday. Here is the very latest forecast cone. This is fresh data from the National Hurricane Center that came in at the top of the hour. The latest cone has been shifted farther east, so away from the I-35 corridor. Landfall is a tropical storm is still expected somewhere and along the middle Texas coast late tomorrow. And here's the rainfall potential. We are on the dry side of this tropical system, which means we are looking at the lower end of rainfall totals. A lot of us are looking at less than an inch of rain over the next several days. But look at the coast places like the Houston area down south toward Galveston could see more than 10 inches of rain from this tropical system. We'll take a look at the latest satellite data, uh, the latest uh, pressure Sure, wind speed and movement coming up in just a few minutes, and I'll have your local forecast for the rest of the week, guys.
Katie, thank you. A small plane crashes into a neighborhood after losing power in both engines. And get this, the pilot was able to walk away from the crash with only a bump to the head. Now, this happened in Mongolia, just 40 miles northwest of Houston. The man told officers he started to look for a place to land when the first engine failed. And as he was coming down to the with the second engine failed, as a result, he slammed into a tree which braced his fall before hitting the ground. A new episode of KSAT Explains is out on Tuesday and it'll make you hungry. This week, the Explains team is diving into San Antonio's taco culture. Myra Arthur gives us a preview. Whether they're puffy, street style, or served up for breakfast, San Antonio knows tacos. Tacos is what brings us together, so tacos involved, everybody gets along. The city is saturated with taco trucks and taquerias, some that have been staples here for decades. We've been open from 56. Same family, it's been passed on to different owners. We keep the recipes, we've been so many generations working here. They come in different styles with different types of meat. Hizo tripa, bistec, lengua, cabeza, suadero y pastor. And just when you think you know everything there is to know about San Antonio's taco scene, something new emerges. It's kind of like a half Asian, half Mexican taco. You can find tacos now of tikka masala chicken. You can find tacos of bulgogi beef. Food is a language that everyone speaks, you know, and fusing it together, it's just another way that we can all get together and share the same thing. A taco will feed the soul of every human being. If it's crafted right, it's perfection. Make no mistake about it, San Antonio is the culinary and cultural capital of Texas. In that very tasty episode of KSAT Explained, San Antonio Taco Culture will be available to stream on demand Tuesday. We'll live stream the episode at 7 p.m. on KSAT.com, the KSAT TV app, and KSAT's Facebook page. And if you can't watch it live, we'll post a full episode. You can watch it on demand later Tuesday evening. On Capitol Hill, leaders are going back and forth on the $3.5 trillion budget resolution bill. Why some want to wait to reevaluate the proposal while others are ready to move forward. Plus, she might look like an ordinary culinary student, but her life is far from that. From coming to America to dealing with an autoimmune disease, we're highlighting her story this week on What's Up South Texas. And new CDC data shows hospitalization rates are four times higher compared to last year. How the Biden administration is defending their decision to create vaccine mandates for businesses. New York City will begin enforcing Mayor Bill de Blasio's vaccine rules on Monday, requiring anyone over the age of 12 to show proof of vaccination for things like indoor dining, gyms or theaters. President Biden is hoping his new vaccine mandate encourages more Americans to roll up their sleeves. Here's ABC's Andrew Dimbert with the details. Nearly three quarters of eligible Americans have received at least one dose of a COVID vaccine, but still, the Delta variant continues to fuel a surge in cases across the country. They are uh, scared and um, it looks painful. They're struggling to breathe, they're hypoxic. They've been sick for multiple days and um, they are almost all entirely unvaccinated. At least seven states are running out of ICU beds. 73-year-old Ray Demonia had to travel to a facility 200 miles from his home in Alabama for a cardiac ICU bed. After he died, his family using his obituary to ask people to please get vaccinated to free up resources for non-COVID related emergencies like his. Vaccination works and will protect us from the severe complications of COVID-19. President Biden man mandating businesses with more than 100 employees to either require vaccinations or enforce weekly testing. The U.S. Surgeon General defending the move by the president. Let's help us get through this, keep our kids in school, keep our economy going, and give us a peace of mind that so many people have desperately wanted since this pandemic began. But Republican governors of at least 19 states vowing to fight back. This is an unprecedented uh, assumption of federal uh, mandate uh, authority that really disrupts and divides the country. Children now account for one in four new COVID infections, and many are not yet eligible for the vaccine. The FDA out with a warning for parents not to give children under 12 the COVID vaccine until the agency gives authorization, saying in part, children are not small adults. Andrew Dimbert, ABC News, New York.
Moving to weather now, and it's a little cooler today, but a lot is churning out there in the Gulf. Yeah, a smidge cooler. Uh, we got, yes. We got Nicholas. Yes, we Clowning do. Clowning out there right now, huh? Yes, <laughs> we do. It has ramped up quickly. It became a tropical storm earlier this morning, right about 10 a.m. Texas time. And this is the same tropical wave or area of unorganized shower activity that we've been watching for the past few days. And this will have impacts on Texas in the next several days. Let's start with your high temperatures for today. Pretty seasonable, mainly because of all the cloud cover we had around. Also some showers nearly south of Highway 90. Currently, we are still locked into a lot of cloud cover. This is a solid mix of some lower and also some high cloud cover and it's going to be with us for the next couple of days. This is being pushed in ahead of tropical storm Nicholas. As far as rain goes currently, it's quiet across our area, but there are some bands of rain moving into deep south Texas between Corpus Christi and Brownsville. There is Nicholas. We have fresh data that came in at 10 o'clock from the Hurricane Center. Still a tropical storm. Wind speeds have not changed. Pressure dropped a smidge, not by much, but the movement is what has really changed since the late afternoon update. Earlier today, the system was moving at 14 miles per hour. It has dropped down to just two miles per hour. There's the center of circulation, some deeper convection off to the north of that center. This slow movement is really not good news because Nicholas is moving into some of the warmest waters in the Gulf of Mexico. Here are some buoy readings, and this is the warmest part of the Gulf currently. Tropical systems, they Feed on warm water. Warm water really helps them to intensify, organize a bit more, and strengthen. So unfortunately, the slow movement of this system over this warm part of the Gulf could aid in some intensification, especially as we get into the day on Monday. You'll see the track through tomorrow night and then eventually late tomorrow into early Tuesday morning does have the system slowly moving along uh, the lower and middle Texas coastline. So another kind of clearer look at the track for you through tomorrow morning. It is still south uh, southeast of Brownsville and then during the day Monday, this is expected to hug the Texas coastline between Brownsville and Corpus Christi with an eventual landfall sometime very late Monday night or early Tuesday morning along the middle upper Texas coast and then a more even northeasterly turn to the right than what we've seen in earlier forecast uh, forecast cones from the Hurricane Center. So again, we've been kind of stressing this the past couple of days. It's looked like we were going to be on the drier side of this system and it still looks like that is going to be the case with the highest rainfall totals on the east side. That'll be for places like the Houston area, 7 to 10 inches of rain down near Galveston, Beaumont, more than 10 inches of rain possible down near Corpus Christy, they're looking at five to seven inches of rain. And then as you work farther west, rainfall totals will likely sharply fall off. Those of us here in San Antonio along I-35, some lucky folks could see maybe an inch of rain, but a lot of us are looking at a little less than that. So let's take a look at future cast here. We'll start through the overnight hours. Again, that center is still well down to the south of Brownsville. As we head into the overnight hours, some bands of rain will start to move inland, so we'll wake up to an isolated rain chance tomorrow, mainly for areas south and east of San Antonio. There's the center of circulation. As we get into tomorrow afternoon, I expect some periods of passing downpours, so not a constant rain all day but some passing scattered downpours will be possible for a lot of us as we head into tomorrow. But look, more of a constant, steady rain for areas like Corpus Christi up to Victoria and then the Houston area. That trend, unfortunately, will likely continue into Monday night and then into Tuesday as that tropical system slowly moves north, pushing all that moisture in. So I wanted to show you this future cast model with the forecast cone because it illustrates really well that we are going to be on the very dry side of this system. That doesn't mean we won't see rain, but I do think tomorrow is our best opportunity for some passing scattered downpours. So no severe weather tomorrow, but some periods of heavy rain possible, some flashes of lightning as well. With the cloud cover and those downpours, most of us will be stuck in the 80s tomorrow. That's not too shabby. Breezy tomorrow and into Tuesday as well. Now, for some of our viewers east of 35, I'm talking Gonzales, Hallettsville, Cuero. You could see some wind gusts starting to approach tropical storm status as we get into tomorrow night and Tuesday. And we do have parts of the viewing area under a tropical storm watch. We'll take a look at that info coming up next half hour, guys. Thank you so much, Katie. Mm -hmm. And we'll be right back. The good, the bad, and the ugly of the Cowboys lost to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers with more on what's on instant replay tonight 
Let's check in with our Greg Simmons. Greg. Let's see the good Dak Prescott, the ugly, the kicking game, bad in between. <laughs> All right. Yeah. And the Houston Texans kick out their 2021 regular season with a new coach and no Deshaun Watson in the house. And it didn't matter. Coming up tonight on a brand new edition of Instant Replay. We'll make a step from tonight. Uh, we'll get we'll find a way to get better tomorrow. And that's the process. We're going to stick to it. And um, we've got a good we've got a good team and good men. And yeah, I'm, I'm excited about what do you Sorry, Dak. What do you take from the Cowboys' loss to defending Super Bowl champions by just two points to kick off the 2021 NFL regular season? Dak's back, but where does Dallas need the most help now heading into week two against the Chargers? Taylor in the backfield on third and four. This side, end zone. Touchdown, Johnson. The Houston Texans kicked off their 2021 regular season today by hosting the Jacksonville Jaguars with the number one draft pick in the NFL calling their shots. But the spotlight was on Tyrod Taylor, and he did not disappoint with Deshaun Watson not even in the house. We'll show you and highlights from every single game played in the NFL today. And who had the best catch, the best pass, the best game, and that best hit before we kick off week four of the high school football season? It's time for the best of big game coverage in our all-new 12 Stop 12 and 12 Stop 12 Sub 5A poll. And what about UTSA's big home opener shutout of Lamar? The sports guys sound off on that tonight. All that plus, what surprised you the most this weekend? Tonight, you decide. Instant replay is live, and it's after the night beats. We're going to cram it all in 30 minutes somehow. A jam-packed <laughs> show. Now you got all <laughs> kinds of football back, Greg. You got it. Thanks very much. And stay with us. We'll be right back. The debate on Capitol Hill continues. Progressive Democrats threatening to stall the president's 1.1 trillion bipartisan infrastructure bill if the state does not approve the accompanying 3.5 trillion reconciliation bill. That's a lot of money. And here's ABC's Faith Abube with the details. After passing with bipartisan support in the Senate, President Biden's $1.1 trillion infrastructure bill is in jeopardy. Progressive Democrats have said they'll not advance it in the House unless the Senate approves the accompanying $3.5 trillion budget resolution. But moderate Democratic Senator Joe Manchin in an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal last week saying a strategic pause on the measure is necessary. We have the unknown, and the unknown is everything you've been talking about. COVID, what's going to happen with COVID, what it'll do to the economy, no one's talking about inflation or debt, and we should have that as part of the discussion. The budget resolution calls for investments in things such as clean energy incentives, child care subsidies, and the expansion of Medicare to include hearing, dental, and vision. It is much wider in scope than the $1.1 trillion bipartisan infrastructure bill. That's the one that has the urgent and emergency that we have. Let's get that one done. It's setting over in the House right now. Budget Committee Chairman Senator Bernie Sanders agrees infrastructure is important. But I happen to think that the needs of the human beings of our country, working families, the children, the elderly, the poor, are even more important. And we can and must do both. The Senate returns to Washington on Monday, the tentative deadline for committees to turn in their draft legislation to Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and Sanders is Wednesday. I think we're going to work it out, but it would really be a terrible, terrible shame for the American people if both bills went down. If Manchin doesn't support the reconciliation plan as it stands, it'll be a blow to Democrats who need a simple majority or 50 votes plus the vice president as a tiebreaker to pass it in the Senate. Faith Abube, ABC News, Washington. Candidates make last dish efforts for support in California's recall election. Californians decide between Newsom and his main opponent, radio host Larry Elder. Newsom needs 50% of voters to reject the recall to keep his job. The special recall election was triggered largely because voters were unhappy with Newsom's handling of the pandemic. Both candidates throwing their hardest punches in how they plan to handle the pandemic. The contrast and the stakes could not be higher. This election is a matter of life and death. Public health is on the ballot. One of the first things I'm going to do is repeal the uh, the, the requirement for state workers uh, that they have to uh, be tested once a week and they have to wear masks at work. I don't think the science supports that. The special election is taking place this Tuesday. International news now. The United Kingdom's Prince Andrew will be in court tomorrow for his first hearing for the sexual assault lawsuit he's facing. 
Uh, the case brought by a woman who claimed she was introduced to the prince by the late convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein. Lawyers for Virginia Jufre claimed they were su successfully served papers to Queen Elizabeth's second son. A New York judge will hear arguments from her lawyers Monday and decide whether the prince has indeed been officially served. That will determine whether the lawsuit can continue. Jufre is accused of accusing Prince Andrew of sexually assaulting her at Epstein's in the Manhattan Mansion back in 2001 and in the London home of Trelane Maxwell when she was under the age of 18. The computer chip shortage may stretch it to 2023. That's the word from one major manufacturer. And that's having a big impact on car production. As a result, used cars are in hot demand. Buying used cars can be a good move, but it can also be a headache if the car has problems. 12 in your size, Marilyn Moore, on how to make a smart buy on a used car. My car started making a weird noise. My air conditioner stopped working again. And then when I got home from my honeymoon, the check engine light came on. I'm done. I'm buying something else. But as Dan Barkium learned, finding a used car for sale is a challenge. The shortage of new cars available for sale right now has actually made demand for used cars jump too. The average price of a used car has jumped 12.5% over the past year. So what can you do? First tip from Consumer Reports, be open-minded. Research current pricing and deals on several models to increase your chances of finding what you want. So I started looking between CRVs, RAV4s, CX-5. I researched other dealerships just to see what they were charging for similar cars. Also, don't rush into a purchase when you find the used car you want for a sweet price. If the price is too good, there could be a problem. When buying any used car, check for open recalls at nitsa.gov recalls. You can also get a vehicle history report. But the best way to ensure that a car is roadworthy is to have it inspected by an independent mechanic before you buy it. But what if you buy a bum car from a licensed dealer? Texas Lemon Law will only help if the car is still under manufacturer's warranty. And if you buy from a private seller, you have fewer protections. So Consumer Reports advice, get as many guarantees about the condition of the vehicle in writing, just in case you end up in court. If you're looking to sell good news, you'll probably get more now than ever, especially for an SUV or a pickup truck or a car less than five years old. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. Target's big car seat trade-in is back. If your little one is starting to outgrow their car seat, then listen up. Target will take it off your hands and give you a 20% off coupon on a new one. The coupon is also good for other things, including strollers, high chairs, and rockers. The trade-in will last for two weeks starting Sunday and will run through September 25th. Target says it will take any car seat you have, even if it's damaged, and that includes seat bases, harnesses, and boosters. The coupons can be used through October 2nd. Astronauts complete NASA spacewalk to prepare for International Space Station power boost. The spacewalk walk lasted nearly seven hours beginning at 915 this morning. Now, during the walk, the two astronauts installed a modification kit to prepare for a rollout solar array installation work. When new solar arrays are sent to the space station, the kit placed today will allow them to install a third solar panel during a future walk. This was the 244th spacewalk at the ISS. Back here on Earth, hope you had a great weekend as we look outside with live cam. Bright blue skies yesterday, some lower humidity, and then changes today. I know you noticed not quite as dry this afternoon and a lot more cloud cover. We even had some showers and storms out there, mainly south of Highway 90. I mentioned last half hour, we do have some of our counties under a tropical storm watch. That includes Gonzales, Lavaca, DeWitt, and Carnes counties. Uh, we'll talk about what that means coming up. Um, and of course, get you another look at the very latest on Tropical Storm Nicholas as it is poised to make landfall along the middle and upper Texas coast late tomorrow, early on Tuesday. Save. Shao Chi and the legend of the Ten Rings opened in first place in its debut weekend. How did Marvel's newest superhero fare this week at the box office? And we've all heard the phrase, donate blood and save a life. Next, we'll introduce you to a young woman who's alive today thanks to generous blood donations. A young woman who suffers from a blood disorder is hoping her story inspires others to become blood donors. 
That woman is 19-year-old Naomi Hennessy, and she's next on What's Up South Texas. Now, Naomi hasn't let that obstacle keep her from living her life to the fullest. Here's her story and how her life has impacted others, especially her mother. I love cooking. I like being in the kitchen. 19-year-old Naomi Hennessy definitely knows her way around a kitchen. When I get my degree, I want to work in hotel and become a chef and work my way up to higher position. <laughs> Naomi is your ordinary young woman studying culinary arts at St. Philip's College. But she wouldn't have this ordinary life if it wasn't for the South Texas Blood and Tissue Center. The fact that those units have been donated by wonderful, healthy people, we are incredibly grateful. Naomi has thalassemia, an autoimmune disease that prevents her from making red blood cells. I've seen her when she's when her, she's really low and needs blood now. Her mother, Annette Hennessy, adopted Naomi from China, even after being told Naomi wasn't expected to live past the age of 14. She pulled me aside and explained to me that that my daughter was going to die. And did I really want to go through with this adoption? You know, spoiler, she's 19. <laughs> she's fine. <laughs> she's not dying anytime soon. But that's because in China, they don't have a good blood supply. Before coming to America, Naomi was only getting a couple of units of blood a year, going months without a transfusion. Now, as an American citizen since age 10, she gets at least 40 units a year. Let's go get blood every three weeks. By the end of this year, she would have had 300 transfusions. And while she receives blood, her mother gives it. I have to donate. I have to donate for her. I have to donate for the guy down the street that's got cancer. I have to donate for the girl around the corner that has sickle cell anemia. Somebody needs that blood. The family knows firsthand what it's like when there is a blood shortage. Both Naomi and her mother are hoping their story encourages people to donate blood when they can. Each bag is there to help somebody out. You'll never know who needs the blood and who needs it right now. For What's Up South Texas, I'm Jaffney Gray. Welcome back, everybody, and all eyes are on Tropical Storm Nicholas. Yes, a lot of action taking place, Katie. Definitely, and folks are going to hear a lot about this over the next few days. And I want to reiterate the most extreme impacts will not be in the San Antonio area. They're going to be along the Texas coast, but we do know folks have friends and family there in the Houston area where they are expecting close to a foot of rain over the next few days and, and maybe have interest along the coast. I know a lot of folks like to uh, vacation down near the beach. Maybe you've got some property there, so that's why we want to keep you thoroughly updated. Again, the latest numbers on Nicholas, still a tropical storm, a very slow low moving tropical storm north at just two miles per hour. The center of this storm is sitting over some very warm Gulf water and its slow movement is going to open the door for some intensification tonight and during the day tomorrow as it slowly just meanders over this warm water in the western Gulf. So by Monday 7 p.m. center still expected to be offshore and honestly the longer that the system is over water the more time it has to potentially intensify. But formally, the forecast from the Hurricane Center does have Nicholas making a landfall somewhere along the middle upper Texas coast early Tuesday as a high in tropical storm. Then it will continue to slowly move northeast and farther inland toward the Houston area as we get into Tuesday and Wednesday. Here's the forecast peak storm surge along the coast, generally from about San Antonio Bay south, two to four feet of storm surge is expected. Same story near Galveston Bay and then points north. But between about Matagorda Bay and Galveston Bay, or San Luis Pass. That's where the highest storm surge is expected, three to five feet possible there. And remember, storm surge is the amount of water that comes up over the expected tide level. So that's three to five feet of water up on the ground over where normal tide would put the water level. So uh, that causes big time flooding issues along the coast. That is part of the reason why here in this pink area, essentially Rockport to just south of Galveston along the coast, there's actually a hurricane watch in place for that higher storm surge level and also the potential for some hurricane force wind gusts. And again, this is something we're going to have to watch here. If that system just stays over the warm water tomorrow, it could intensify to a low end hurricane before making landfall. So we've got a hurricane watch there over a smaller section of the coast, but a larger section is under a tropical storm warning. So tropical storm force winds and two to four feet of storm surge imminent here in this bright purple area 
farther inland. And again, this is some of our easternmost counties, a tropical storm watch. This means that tropical storm force winds will be possible places from Carnes County up to Gonzales over to Hallettsville. This would likely be a brief window, but tropical storm force winds possible. Again, that's well east of San Antonio. And for our viewers in the KSAT viewing area, if you're under that tropical storm watch, keep in mind you're not worried about the surge because you're not down near the coast. Uh, look at this, though. This is kind of the overarching idea. Flash flood watch along the entire Texas Gulf Coast, even into parts of Louisiana. Flash flooding is going to be the big issue with Nicholas over the next couple of days. Meanwhile, it's 80 in Gonzales, 76 in Uvalde. We've got plenty of cloud cover still out there. Not so much to talk about in the way of rain, but I do expect overnight we'll start to see some of these bands trickle into South Texas, so some isolated showers will be possible early tomorrow. But look at this. The constant rain is going to be more of an issue for Houston, Galveston, down all along the coast, all the way down to the Corpus Christi area. Nonetheless, I will keep it a mention for some passing scattered downpours for us on Monday. But then as we get into Tuesday and that center really moves off to the east, that will really help to trim our rain chances back. So tomorrow does look like our best chance of rain out of the system. After that, we'll bring our rain chances back to isolated levels. And of course, we'll have team coverage to keep you updated on Nicholas's impact on the rest of the state over the next few days. Definitely nice. a good time to get that Weather Authority app downloaded. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh huh. And coming up from a Disney adventure film to a video game themed action comedy. Up next, we'll have this weekend's box office results. If you look to the left of the boat, you'll see some very playful toucans. Disney's Jungle Cruise made its seventh weekend voyage, netting $2.4 million, while Candyman scared up $4.8 million. The horror yarn Malignant debuted in third on ticket sales of $5.6 million. Ryan Reynolds' video game-themed action comedy Free Guy leveled up from third to second place with $5.8 million, bringing its domestic box office total to $101.9 million. I'm not here to fight anybody. Okay, I'm looking for my sisters. Marvel's Shang-Chi and The Legend of the Ten Rings held on to first place in its sophomore weekend in theaters. The hero flick starring Simu Liu brought in $35.8 million for a two-week total of $145.6 million in North America. In Hollywood, I'm Rick Damage. Jella. After stunning Illinois, the UTSA Roadrunners scored their first ever shutout in their home opener against Lamar. And the Aggies came back to beat Colorado with their starting quarterback. Let's find out what else is on instant replay tonight by heading over to our Greg Simmons. Yeah, they had to go to their backup because of the injury to their starting quarterback. And who's to blame with the Longhorns' embarrassing loss of the Razorbacks in Arkansas coming up tonight on a brand new edition of Instant Replay. When, when you spend as much time with student athletes as we do, and they work as hard as they do, it's just fun to watch them happy in the locker room. The UTSA Roadrunners scored their first shutout in school history in their home opener against Lamar, and at the same time held the Cardinals to the fewest yards in the history of the Roadrunner football program. Delzada flushed off his spot, floating for Spiller! Touchdown, Texas a Yeah, that was a late when the fighting Texas Aggies score a comeback victory in Colorado even after losing their starting quarterback to an injury. And who's to blame for the Longhorns embarrassing loss of the Razorbacks in Arkansas? The sports guys are back tonight with their opinions. And how did the Texans do today without Deshaun Watson at quarterback? And who takes the U.S. Open? Instant replay is live, and it is next. You know, fun fact, Arkansas, mm. you know, that's me. That's you. Uh, I'm like the Razorbacks. I was actually Arkansas State University, Red Wolves, nah. but we represented Razorbacks. But you know so. where Fayetteville is, right? Yeah, and that's buddy. where that went down. Mm -hmm. I, that, if you asked about biggest surprise, how poorly Texas did, that's, Especially that's my vote. Especially the offensive line. Yeah. All right. All right, Greg, we'll see you in just a little bit gotcha. on this replay. Stay with us.